Today, markets reach new highs. The DFA Daily to the 13th of March 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Quick market update. The Dow hit record highs on Friday. Although the tech sector didn't do quite as well. And US rates climbed to pre-pandemic levels. While the reflation trade continued to boost cyclical stocks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.9% or 293 points to end at a closing record of 32,778. And the S&P 500 rose 0.1% to 3,943. But the Nasdaq was down 0.59%, but not as low as it had been during the day when it was down 2%. In fact, the tech hezzy Nasdaq has underperformed the Dow four straight weeks. That's a first since 2016. And market experts have been predicting a tech cooldown for years, and it's been consistently wrong, thanks to the increasing dominance of mega capital companies like Apple and Amazon, and the frenzy around Tesla, and the massive shift in spending to cloud computing, and of course the lockdowns and the tech support that was required through that period. And it's worth keeping in mind that while the index is down about 12% from its all-time highs last Monday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is making new all-time highs. Such a marked divergence between two major indices is often not a healthy sign, as there is a shift away from technology to industrial on Wall Street. However, like it or not, technology is here to stay And it's a leading economic indicator. In contrast, industrial production has been of lesser importance for decades, especially in the US. There is no reason to believe this trend is all of a sudden going to change. Thus, the financial markets are potentially starting to give us warning signs about what lies ahead further down the road. The US Treasury yield jumped to a more than one year high of 1.64 on bets that there will be a faster pace of inflation as the economy is expected to stage a stronger recovery thanks to yet another round of stimulus. The continuation of massive funding will lead to rising inflationary implications in the longer term as the economy eventually attempts to grow organic legs, one observer said. The uptick in inflation through the summer months will ultimately prove modest though, reinforcing the Fed's nonchalant approach to rising inflation expectations or a backup in rates, it added. The rise in rates, however, forced investors to abandon long-duration tech stocks, which have strong long-term growth prospects, but are yet not cash flow positive. Apple was also under pressure on signs of weak iPhone demand. iPhone shipments in February were down 14%, according to Morgan Stanley, citing data from the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology. This is consistent with our view that the lengthening replacement cycles are likely to drive lower and lower demand peaks in iPhone redesign years, Morgan Stanley said. Sentiment on tech was also soured by a sea of red across Chinese tech stocks on fears of a regulatory crackdown on the sector. Alibaba fell more than 3% after the Wall Street Journal reported that China's antitrust regulators are weighing up a record fine for the e-commerce giant. Meanwhile, the $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package that President Joe Biden signed on Thursday will send direct payments of $1,400 to most Americans and it will also expand the child tax credit and provide rental and utility assistance. Add to that Biden's pronouncement that all adults will be eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine by May 1 and the economy looks poised for a big rebound in 2021. At least that's what the market is banking on. There's pent-up demand for actually going out and doing stuff 
taking vacations, going to bars and restaurants. People are going to take all that money on the sidelines and spend it. Even though Biden and the Democratic Congress are focused on expanding green energy alternatives, the current outlook for travel and getting back to work is benefiting traditional oil and gas companies. Within the S&P 500, energy stocks are performing the best this year, up 40% as a group. And the top performing groups this week were consumer discretionary stocks, real estate and utilities. Cyclicals, meanwhile, continue to ride the waves of economic optimism led by gains in financials and industrials. Some on Wall Street suggest that cyclicals will remain in favour as long as rates continue to climb. Short duration is likely to outperform long duration if interest rates rise towards irate strategies targets in the second quarter 2021, said Goldman Sachs. They're forecasting an additional 25 basis points of upside to the 10-year US Treasury yield by the second quarter of 2021. And in other news, AMC Entertainment rallied after LA County said that Los Angeles will be lowering restrictions to the second tier of California's COVID-19 reopening system, paving the way for movie theatres to reopen. Now let's look at the rest of the markets. Over in the US, the Dow Jones was up 0.9% to 32,777. The S&P 100 was down 0.12% to 1,786. And the S&P 500 was up 0.1% to 3,943. The S&P 500 financials was down 0.28% to 57015. And the Nasdaq Composite was down 0.59% to 13,319. The Volatility Index was down 5.57% to 2069. Among the stocks, Goldman Sachs was up 1.96% to 348.81. Google Alphabet was down 2.41% to 2050. And Amazon was down 0.77% at 3089. Apple was down 0.76% to 12103. Facebook was down 2% to 26840. And Boeing was up 6.82% to 269.19. And GE was up 2.53% to 1258. Intel fell 0.65% to 62.90. And GameStop was up 1.73% to 264.50. So another rise there. Over in Bondland, the 30-year Treasury was down 0.94% to 2.378. The 10-year bond was down 0.63% to 1.625. And the 3-year bond was down 0.85% to 0.339. While the 3-month was up 10% to 0.033. The dollar index was up 0.27% to 91.66. Over in the UK, the FTSE was up 0.36% to 6,761. And the Financial Services Index in the UK was down 0.44% to 814.41. With the Royal Bank of Scotland up 2.01% to 196.5. And Metro Bank down 0.04% to 124.05. The pound US dollar was down 0.54% to 1.3915. And in Germany, the DAX was down 0.46% to 14,502. While the German 10-year bond was down 0.05% to minus 0.295. And the 30-year bond was down 3.9% to 0.232. Deutsche Bank was up 1.37% to 1064. And the Euro-US dollar was down 0.23% to 1.1956. The Italian two-year bond was down 3.75% to minus 0.387. The Nikkei index was up 1.73% to 29,717. 
while the Shanghai Composite was up 0.47% to 3,453. The US dollar yuan was up 0.23% to 6.5085. Gold futures was up 0.17% to 1,725. Silver was down 0.7% to 2,601. Copper was up 0.36% to 4.154. And crude oil was down 0.68% to 6557. The stock's 600 global index was down 0.26% to 423.08. While the iShares Russell 2000 ETF was up 0.59% to 233.59. The US S&P 500 futures was up 0.14% to 3,942. The NASDAQ futures was down 0.86% to 12,936. And in crypto land, Ethereum was down 3.46% to 1,752. While Bitcoin was down 1.25% to 56,661, making another run to new heights. Locally, last week, Philip Lowe gave an important speech underscoring their stubborn approach to low interest rates low unemployment and the intent to QE to Bilio if needed. Specifically, he declared that the cash rate will stay on hold at 0.1% until actual inflation was consistent with the 2 to 3% target. That's a shift, of course, from forecasting, as we've discussed before. He went on to say that wages growth will need to be sustainably above 3% on the wage price index measurement for inflation to be within the 2 to 3% target band. And, of course, we're nowhere near that now, as this chart shows. The RBA very strongly disagrees with market pricing for rate rises starting as early as late 2022 and again in 2023, with the cash rate very likely to remain at its current level until at least 2024, he said. Given the RBA's judgment that we are unlikely to see wages growth consistent with the inflation target before 2024, in particular, Lowe noted that over the past couple of weeks, market pricing has implied an expectation of possible increases in the cash rate as early as late next year. And then again in 2023, he basically said that this is not an expectation that we share. And Lowe stressed that we are a long way from a world in which growth is running at 3% plus, where local and overseas evidence strongly suggests that the journey back to sustainably higher rates of wages growth will take time and will require a tight labour market for an extended period. This view, of course, reflects the common experience of weak wages growth in the advanced economies, which he argues has partly been driven by powerful and persistent structural factors such as globalisation and technology advances. He didn't mention migration, but he should have. The RBA will ignore transitory fluctuations in inflation, such as relative price shifts during the pandemic and higher food prices after a long drought, noting that headline inflation will soon temporarily exceed 3% as weak pandemic-affected outcomes drop out of the annual calculation. But these transitory effects are not the same as structural inflation. The RBA is aiming for an inflation rate of 2 point something and the maximum possible sustainable level of employment in Australia. The RBA now thinks full employment could equate to an unemployment rate in the low fours. Previously, they were saying 4.5%. And in the subsequent Q&A session, they actually said it was conceivable that a high threes was on the cards. The RBA would rely on wages and price data to provide a signal as to how close Australia is to full employment. But three point something is a long way from where we are. And again, I would underscore, if you have high migration, it ain't going to happen. The RBA rejected the widely held market and economist view that they will drop the 0.1% target for the three-year bond yield. Lowe saying that consistent with a judgment that the conditions for an increase in the cash rate is unlikely to be met until 2024, the bank remains committed to the three-year yield target. For the avoidance of doubt, he continued, we are not considering removing the target or changing the target from 10 basis points. 
So talk about rate rises, put them on the back burner perhaps. On the equally contentious subject of whether yield targets will become date-based using the April 2024 government bond or extended to the November 2024 bond, Lowe said the board has, though, discussed the question of whether to keep the April 2024 bond as the target bond or to move to the next bond, that is the November 2024 bond, and he added that the RBA will consider it again later in the year. As more information about the economic recovery and the labour market. The RBA would consider further extending QE later in the year as it is prepared to undertake further bond purchases if that is required to reach our goals. He said in the meantime, the RBA remains prepared to alter the timing of purchases depending on market liquidity and functioning as was the case when it bought more bonds last week. So the markets should be pricing in a high likelihood of QE4 after the second 100 billion bond buying program ends, and another one probably later. Later in the year, the board will also consider the case for further extending the bond purchase program, he said. We are prepared to undertake further bond purchases if that's required to reach our goals. So, QE to infinity. Lowe added that the argument for the stimulus was being considered at each board meeting where the general principle was whether sufficient progress was being made towards the target and if the RBA could accelerate that progress in a helpful way. And he also made the point that the RBA is carefully watching the strong recovery in the housing market where the Council of Financial Regulators, which is chaired of course by Lowe, could deploy prudential measures if a deterioration in lending standards led to a speculative boom. So, in other words, control the housing market by lending restrictions rather than interest rates. Weird, of course, that this was in the same week that the Senate agreed to allow the removal of the responsible lending obligations. More on that shortly. And to underscore the point about that 0.1% target and the very low bond rates over the next three years, the RBA messed in the repo markets by stopping the Commonwealth Treasury lending out three-year government bonds. This meant that bond short sellers were not able to take positions to speculate on market movements. And so the consequence is that the RBA actually holds the three-year bond keys now as the main lender of three-year bonds via QE. And that means that it increased the cost of borrowing those bonds, effectively making a short sell play horribly expensive. As a result, the three-year bond finally came back to their target range. So once again, free markets are off the agenda and the RBA is controlling yet another card in their hand. And we also heard on Friday that ASIC and APRA have called time on their investigation of Westpac for potential breaches of the Banking Act, putting an end to one of the biggest dramas in the financial sector. APRA announced that it ended their investigation into Westpac, which had been underway since late 2019. It had begun after the Australian Transaction Reporting and Analysis Centre, or ASTRAC, made allegations that the Big Four Bank had broken rules pertaining to money laundering and counter-terrorism. Last June, APRA instructed ASIC to broaden the investigation, adding breaches to the Corporations Act to the ongoing case under the Banking Act. But having carefully considered the results of ASIC's investigation, APRA has determined to close its investigation. Westpac remains subject to a court-enforceable undertaking to implement an integrated risk governance remediation plan to uplift risk governance across its businesses with ongoing independent reviews into its progress. And the $1 billion operational risk capital add-on, which reflects the bank's heightened operational risk profile, will also remain in place until Westpac completes its remediation under the CEU to APRA's satisfaction. And finally, back to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee, which recommended on Friday that the bill repealing responsible lending laws should be passed. The committee has released its final report for its inquiry into the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment Supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2020. Well, that title tells it all. Talk about the spin. The bill largely focuses on amending the credit laws so that they can remove responsible lending obligations and extend the best interest duty to more credit assistance providers, among other changes. The chief intention of the removal of the responsible lending obligations, as set out by the federal government, is to reduce the time it takes for individuals and small businesses to access credit and streamline 
lending regulation. They said, after receiving more than 100 submissions and holding two hearings into the matter, the committee has now recommended that the bill be passed and the obligations repealed. The report reads, the committee notes that a well-functioning credit market is essential for economic growth and for Australia's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic specifically. The committee agrees that the current consumer credit protection framework is potentially overly prescriptive and that regulatory duplication between the responsible lending obligations under the Credit Act and the prudential standards used by APRA could be an issue. It went on to say that it was concerned by evidence that the regulatory framework has resulted in consumers being unable to access credit in a timely manner to buy their first home or to obtain a grant under the Home Builder Scheme, and it added it was also concerned by the invasive and onerous nature of the inquiry and verification process required under the existing responsible lending obligations. The report read, The committee notes the key concerns with the proposed reforms raised by inquiry participants, both through their submissions and at the two public hearings held in Canberra. The committee is of the view that these regulatory changes will not undermine consumer protections and that the principles of responsible lending is deeply embedded in Australia's broad regulatory framework, with which credit providers and credit assistance providers must still operate within and comply with. And additionally, the committee notes the vital role that the AFCA plays in the effective resolution of complaints and redress for consumers who need it. It is a free, fast and independent dispute resolution scheme which involves the level of support and outcomes for consumers, especially those who are in substantial hardship. The committee suggests that the government continue to raise awareness of and promote the dispute resolution service available through AFCA, with an ongoing focus on continued improvements of AFCA's processes and services. And the Senate Committee also welcomed the extension of the best interest obligations which currently apply only to mortgage brokers, to other credit assistance providers and the enhanced proposed by APRA to its Credit Risk Management Program standards, the APS 220, requiring ADIs to assess an individual's borrowing capacity to repay a loan without substantial hardship. The committee also notes similar arrangements are expected to be put in place for non-ADIs through a legislative instrument. The committee is acutely aware of the harm that unsuitable SACCs and consumer leases can cause vulnerable members of the community and strongly supports the proposed enhancements to consumer protections for these products. It said, in addition to protecting vulnerable members of the community, the committee believes the reforms proposed by the government will promote financial inclusion through the introduction of a new protected earnings amount and a cap on costs for consumer leases. And the committee believes these reforms will reduce the risk that consumers are unable to pay for the basic needs or will default on other commitments. Senator Slade Brockman, the Liberal Senator for Western Australia, and Chair of the committee concluded the committee recommends the bill be passed. The National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment Supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2020 is now scheduled for debate on Monday the 15th of March in the Senate. If the bill is passed... The date of effect for the amendments will be the day after royal assent, but the amendments relating to the best interest obligations will commence six months after that day. Well, I have to say I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed because I do believe that consumers will be significantly disadvantaged by these changes. As I argued in my submission and as covered in an ABC report issued today, it's important to understand that vulnerable households will end up with bigger debts and as a result of that their financial situation could deteriorate over time and frankly banks really have very little obligation now to go into detail and to check and validate information from consumers. It's all down to the consumer now if they actually don't give the right information the bank can come and clobber them later. This is a tilting playing field in favour of banks away from consumers and as a result I fear there will be more mortgage stress and more bad debts down the track. But never mind, of course we need lending because lending is going to drive home prices higher, that's going to drive the economy and that of course is the simplistic myopic view that is driving policy at the moment. Shame on them, I fear we will reap the whirlwind later. And now, here is the local market information. The S&P ASX 100 was up 0.79% on Friday to 5,577. 
and the S&P ASX 200 was up 0.79% to 6,766. The Financial Services Index was up 0.05% to 6,078. And the Real Estate Trusts were up 0.93% to 1,371. The Local Volatility Index was up 6.16% to 1,478. And the S&P ASX 200 Futures was up 0.21% to 6,768. Amongst the banks, ANZ was up 0.07% to 2824. CBA was up 0.05% to 8649. NAB was down 0.08% to 2610. And Westpac was down 0.33% to 2445, despite APRA's announcement. Bank of Queensland was up 0.11% to 889. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank was down 0.79% to 1002. And Suncor was up 0.76% to 1065. Macquarie Group was up 0.64% to 149.60. And AMP was down 0.35% to 1.425 on further issues with regard to the valuation of its businesses. Genworth was up 0.38% to 261. And McGrath was up 0.84% to 60 cents while Yellow Brick Road was down 3.16% to 9.2 cents. AFG was at 2.65. Mortgage Choice was down 1.7% at 1.155. And Afterpay was up 2.18% to 113.42. CIMAC was up 0.85% to 18.94. And the Aussie US dollar was down 0.31% to 77.60, while the Euro Aussie dollar was up 0.16% to 1.5404. The Aussie two year bond was down 11.65% to 0.091. And the target three year was down 11.62% to 0.087. So you can see there the impact of the Reserve Bank's hand. The 10-year bond, though, was up 6.62% to 1.819. So long-term market still perhaps a little more sceptical. The Gold Aussie Cross was up 0.65% to 225.91. And the Bitcoin Aussie Cross was down 0.46% to 73,770. And just a quick reminder before I go that on Tuesday, Tony LaCandre will join us on our live Q&A at 8pm Sydney time and we'll be discussing the latest market development. So much to talk about. So join the chat live or ask a question beforehand via the DFA blog. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.